Hello everyone and welcome back to NeuroSciQ. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe for our weekly neuroscience videos and if you're a frequent visitor, welcome back. In last week's video, we mentioned how some COVID-19 patients are experiencing symptoms that are neurological in nature. So symptoms like seizures, stroke and confusion are coming up when patients check into hospitals. We said that we were going to continue that discussion this week, and so we are going to do that today. First, we're going to talk about ways that COVID-19 might enter the central nervous system, as we kind of touched on that also last week. Then, we're going to talk a little bit about COVID-19's viral life cycle and how it replicates. And finally, we're going to finish up with a case study of a 58-year-old woman who presented with acute necrotizing encephalopathy when she entered the ER with COVID-19. So stay tuned, that's what we'll be discussing today. First of all, I just want to say that COVID-19 is a coronavirus and it's very similar to the MERS virus and even more similar to the SARS virus. One of the main differences between COVID-19 and the SARS virus is that the COVID-19 virus has a 10 to 20 times greater binding affinity in comparison to the SARS virus. Nonetheless, both of these viruses target the same receptor. And again, we touched on this in last week's video. The receptor is the ACE2 receptor, which is important in the renin-angiotensin system in our body. Regardless, this ACE2 receptor is found on our lungs, in our heart, it's also found in our kidneys, in our intestines, in the brain, and in males it's found in the testicles as well. So, we know that if the virus is binding to the ACE2 receptor, and that receptor is also found in our brain, then this virus can potentially enter our neurons and maybe even our glial cells. But we talked a bit about how different coronaviruses have shown to have an effect on the central nervous system in animal studies. But can this happen in humans as well? But, well, thankfully we have protection around our brain. And this protection is the blood-brain barrier. We mentioned this last week as well. So how can the virus potentially pass the blood-brain barrier and infect neurons and glial cells? The way that this might happen is there are a couple of theories. One of the most far-fetched theories is that the virus is actually endocytosed through the blood-brain barrier within a clathrin vesicle. Endocytosis, you can think of it as a cell eating something. So if you have this viral molecule floating around in the bloodstream, then endocytosis would be when a cell grabs that viral molecule and takes it in in a nice vesicle. So that's a theory, but it's far-fetched that this is happening. A second theory that is more plausible is that because of our immune response, we have inflammation and breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, which could allow the virus to pass through and enter the central nervous system. The blood-brain barrier, first of all, consists of the endothelial cells. So you have your vasculature that goes through the brain and your blood is inside these vessels. We have the endothelial cells that make up the outside of the blood vessels. And they have tight junctions, keeping everything nice and secure, so we don't have just anything flowing out of the blood and entering the brain. Around the endothelial cells, we also have astrocytes. So the astrocytes have these projections coming off of them. They're just another type of cell called astrocytes because they kind of look like a star. Um, and they have these projections coming off of them that wrap around the vessel and they help to add further protection. We also have pericytes which fill in any smaller gaps, so there's a pretty robust protective layer. But if we have infection and we have inflammation, this blood-brain barrier can start to break down and we can have viral molecules entering the brain. So that is another suggestion. The third suggestion has to do with a bit of what we talked about last week. 
So patients have been presenting with loss of their sense of smell and so if this is happening because the virus is getting into their receptor cells in the nose then there's the possibility that this virus can go across synapses and enter the brain in that way. So within our nose we actually have receptor cells that connect into the brain through this bone called the cerebriform plate and so if we infect those receptor cells, now they have the virus, there's the potential that that virus can bud off into the brain through the cerebriform plate and travel across synapses to the next neurons within the brain. So those last two are more plausible explanations. Now again, we don't know exactly what's happening, we're just theorizing at this state. But in animal models, it has been shown that when animals were given a dose of the SARS virus within their nasal membrane, that actually did enter the brain and infect their brain stem. So it is a possibility. Now some scientists are even making the leap and saying that the only reason we're having respiratory distress is because this virus is targeting the brain stem and that is causing us to lose our ability to breathe. This is possible, but again, we do have ACE2 receptors on our lungs, so the first problem with shortness of breath is more likely to be coming from the fact that your lungs are infected rather than your brainstem being infected. But in our brainstem, we do have this area called the pre botzinger complex, which helps to coordinate the movements involved for breathing, making sure our diaphragm is moving properly, making sure our lungs expand and contract at the right time, so it is a possible method. Another thing that was suggested from an animal study in which rats were given SARS-CoV-1, which is a version of the coronavirus that can be contracted by these animals, they ended up getting infected in the brainstem as well, even though they weren't given it intranasally. And they think that this might have happened through interactions with receptors in the lungs. So we have chemoreceptors in the lungs to sense the saturation of oxygen and we also have mechanoreceptors in the lungs to detect how stretched our lungs are so that we don't overinflate and our lungs also don't collapse. So they're saying that maybe these receptors were infected and then again there's a transsynaptic spread of the virus eventually getting it up to the brain. But we don't know whether or not this can happen yet because this is such a novel situation for everyone. So I did say we were going to talk a little bit about how COVID-19 is entering these cells. Again, we mentioned the ACE2 receptor. So what happens is COVID actually binds to this receptor on the cells and with that binding, it gains access to the cell. Once it's inside the cell, it has its own single-stranded RNA and this RNA can then be used to make DNA and that DNA can get copied to produce more viral vectors. These viral vectors, after hijacking that cell, will bud off of the cell and exocytose into the body and then from there they can gain access to other cells. So the way transsynaptic travel of this virus would work is if the virus infected a neuron and then the virus budded off at the synapse, it would be able to enter the next neuron in the line of communication. So it can either happen that way or once the virus enters the cell, we have this thing called a cytokine storm, which is triggered. So cytokines are just, the word just means uh, cell movement. Cyto means cell and kine means move. So what they do is these are molecules that trigger the movement of immune cells to an area. And then we have inflammation as the body tries to counteract this virus and get rid of it. With this, we did say that the blood-brain barrier can start to break down with the inflammation, and so we can have edema in the brain, which would mean that blood can enter the brain and the virus can also enter that way. So what would happen is the virus infects the lung's epithelial cells, they produce progeny, this triggers the release of cytokines, the cytokines activate immune cells and the immune cells will then make more cytokines and that's the cytokine storm. Then we have the inflammatory response. Inflammatory cells are recruited and we release even more cytokines 
and so our immune system is just going into overdrive. So the virus does have this neuroinfective potential. And we have seen neurotype symptoms being demonstrated in patients, including vomiting, dizziness, headaches, and confusion. Now, these are only presented in about 1% of patients, but they are seen in 88% of the severe cases. So severe cases tend to have these neurological symptoms. And these symptoms would be coming from the infection of the brainstem, specifically based off of the receptors that the COVID-19 virus binds to. So let's talk a little bit about this case study that I mentioned earlier. So basically what happened is this 58 year old flight attendant came into the hospital and she was presenting herself with confusion. But along with that, she had a serious condition. She had had fever and coughs for several days, muscle aches, and they tested her. When they tested her, she was positive for COVID-19. Later, they tested her with MRI and CT scan to see why she was having these neurological symptoms, and they revealed that she had something called acute necrotizing encephalopathy. Acute necrotizing encephalopathy is rare. What it is, is if we break down the word a little, acute means severe or sudden onset. Necrotizing, necrotizing means cell death, necrosis is cell death, or causing the death of tissue and encephalopathy just indicates that it's happening in the brain. So we have this acute necrotizing encephalopathy which is just death of the tissue within the brain. It happens with viral infections and it has been seen with influenza and what happens is it can lead to seizures and disturbed consciousness. It may progress into a coma and it can cause neurological deficits in young children. Cases are more likely in individuals that have a mutation in this gene called the RANBP2 gene. This is a gene important for the maintenance of the blood-brain barrier. And so if you have that mutation, you can be more susceptible to the infection of the brain with a virus. And once the virus infects the brain, we see symmetric lesions to the thalami. We see symmetric lesions within the brainstem and the cerebellum. So back to our patient who presented with acute necrotizing encephalopathy. What the MRIs showed was that she had symmetric hypotenuation in the bilateral medial thalamus. So what this is, is necrosis of the bilateral medial thalamus. So we see these indicated in this figure A where the arrows are pointing at these darker regions indicating necrosis where these regions shouldn't be dark. We have the other dark regions that are ventricles but usually the thalami have tissue in them so they would present themselves as a lighter sort of gray color on the scan. Again we see it in another slice of the brain and finally we see the same necrosis in another slice of the brain. The important thing is that this is having, happening symmetrical. This indicates that it's likely due to some sort of attack on that brain region. If it's happening on both sides of the brain, then something is probably accessing those particular cells because on each side the thalamus would have the same type of receptors and so both sides of the brain would be attacked, whereas if it was due to perhaps hitting the head, um, it would only be on one side that we see necrosis. So we see this on both sides, but we also see that the patient had hemorrhaging. So she had lesions and hemorrhaging in the bilateral medial temporal lobes and thalami. Hemorrhaging means that blood is getting into the brain, and so it is possible that this could be because of the blood-brain barrier breakdown due to inflammation from the cytokine storm, which allowed the virus to enter the brain and then caused the subsequent necrosis of the thalamic regions. Now, they did do a lumbar puncture, which is, in which, which is a procedure where they take some of the cerebrospinal fluid, which is just a cushiony fluid that flows around our brain, to see if there was any other viruses that might have impacted her brain. Uh, however, she tested negative for those. 
and the CT scan revealed necrosis in the brain tissue while the MRI revealed hemorrhaging. So in her case, it is probable that from the hemorrhaging, the virus was able to gain access to the brain. However, we still don't know how this is happening. We don't know. This is one case that happened to an individual. It can happen to other people, but the likelihood of it happening to somebody is probably quite low. Remember, our channel is not to give you any medical advice. If you're feeling any symptoms, contact telehealth or contact your doctor. Make sure you talk to a professional and, and don't try to come to conclusions from the internet. But we hope you learned a little today. We hope you found that case study interesting and perhaps you learned a little about how viruses can possibly spread to the brain and cause infection of the central nervous system, which is otherwise pretty well protected. Thanks for joining us again for another week's video. We hope you liked that video. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Share this video with your friends and family. And if you have any suggestions for future video topics, leave them down below. We'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions, you can also leave those down below. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thanks for watching. And hopefully we see you next week for another episode of NeuroSciQ so you can keep increasing your neuroscience IQ. See you next time. Thank you.